So without further ado, uh, to talk about Joe Whalen's life and work, please welcome Esther Neeson. <coughs> Um, hi, I'm Esther Neeson. Um, well, if you, if you don't know me, I have a, a gallery and a shop with some other artists here in Buffalo. I've been working as an artist since my first solo show in 2010. Um, I actually came to Buffalo to get as far away from the dairy farm country hamlet I grew up in <laughs> and still pay for a state school because I was broke and uh, ended up falling in love and staying, except for one horrible year in Missouri, which taught me how good Buffalo was. Um, I decided to do this because uh, I used to work at the Birchfield for many years, and I had interacted with his work. I've got a story for that. But um, I thought, oh my god, I'm so scared of doing this. And um, I thought I could, I could do it and, and learn some things in the process and get to know him a little better, although um, I had interacted with him and been to his studio and purchased a piece from him and everything. I uh, never really spent a lot, a lot of time with him. And what I did learn was so wonderful and exciting. And the fact that nobody, not a single person, had anything bad to say about him in the whole process, except himself, <laughs> where he was like, oh, I have a big mouth. And you know, I made that painting, and maybe it's not the best, but I finished it, so it's done. <laughs> And like that's the worst thing you hear about him, and it's just like, what a wonderful legacy to leave behind, that everybody loves you and calls you generous and wonderful and amazing teacher, and it's pretty good. But about public speaking, he even says he goes, you sh if you have no fear about speaking in front of people, you have a massive ego, and you're gonna lie. <laughs> and uh, I know that firsthand because my husband does that; he makes things up. <laughs> So um, I did some research by, I interviewed some people who had interacted with him and dealt with him and I went out to Niagara Art Trail and talked to Jay and got some images and stuff from him. The Birchfield let me dig through, his, through their archive and uh, take some photographs and uh, of course I had handled the pieces so I know their, what they have in their permanent collection pretty well. And um, so that answers my next question was like, why did I pick Joe Whalen? Well, um, people were like, why? Your work is so different. It's mostly like bug related. <laughs> so they were like, why did you pick like this watercolorist? And um, so when I was working at the Birchfield, I w was lucky enough to work during the move when we were archiving all the pieces. And I came across this beautiful piece that Elizabeth Licata actually donated to the collection. Um, it's called the Scarlet Pimpernel, which if you knew him and the way that he titled things is you know, very funny because clearly it has nothing to do with the Scarlet Pimpernel. It's just a red pin. But <laughs> I just loved this piece. Like, the shoes drove me wild. I was like, that is amazing. It's so beautiful. It's only an 8x10, and it's got all of that in it. And uh, so it had an old frame and a cardboard backing, and the glass had gotten broken at some point moving around. And I was like, you gotta fix this, you gotta fix this. And I kept like going over the preparator and be like, when are you gonna reframe this? When are you gonna reframe this? Because this is so good, it shouldn't be in a broken thing. And they were finally like, listen Esther, you do it yourself. I'm gonna show you how to do it, you do it. So that was the first piece for the museum I ever reframed and cut a map for. And I still love it to this day. And I sometimes go over and be like, can I look at it? <laughs> and they let me. <laughs> um, but. Uh, so the Birchville actually has four really wonderful pieces, and I think that they span um, a lot of his major themes. So we've got, I'll come back to the theme thing later, but they have a pool player in red jacket. They have a daily ornament, which is a nice bar scene with a really nice title, I love it. And then they have my second favorite piece, which is Death on a Ledge which he made when he was grieving the uh, murder of his daughter. And this is so stunning. And I've always loved this piece before I knew the story behind it. And um, I always think that when people grieve through art, they really show something beautiful that you can't express any other way. And um, it's so different from a lot of his other stuff that I was always in love handling it. 
So one of the best things I, I really liked about Joe was um, his idea on shape and form. Like he would say, oh, everybody knows shape. Like a kid eating a piece of fruit knows shape. But what an artist does is adds form to that shape. And I, um, Niagara let, Art Trail let me take a bunch of pictures from their, um, they have this beautiful book of drawings that they collected from his studio. And um, this, these sketches I think really, really illustrate like his love of how things move and how um, the form is expressed. And I actually um, have a piece of a man in a coat, so I'm like kind of partial to it. But <laughs> so he was really he was really worried that like when he drew people that people would think he was making fun of them and he wasn't really he was just drawing what he saw and the parts of the form that really engaged him and that he really loved and wanted to celebrate um Mm. There we go. <laughs> so when I was in college, what I learned about the human figure was that no matter what the body looks like, there is some beautiful, fascinating element that you can find in it that can like bring you to tears. And I really, really feel that he had that kind of engagement with the human figure. I've, he loved to um, just really express the form. And I particularly like it in his crowd seeds because there's such a variety. And um, you really get like caught up in it. And part of his like worry with that was, I found a really funny story that he told where he was saying he had uh, drawn these two women that were like shapely women and they were just out shopping and he just thought they were fascinating. And he, he drew them and then put the painting in an exhibition and it was in a window. And then these women came up to the window and saw the painting of themselves and were laughing at it. And he was horrified and hiding inside the gallery because he was afraid that these women were going to be so offended. <laughs> but they were laughing and enjoyed it. So luckily, he got away with that. But uh, <laughs> it, it must have been like um, one of those things where you're on the fence, where you're like, oh, I'm drawing real people, and I'm, I'm showing real life. But what if somebody doesn't like it? So I feel like that he had a little bit of insecurity about that, despite I don't really feel like he need to. Um, so after I reframed the piece and I wrapped the other pieces for the move, I was like, I gotta meet this guy. I just love these works. And so next time he was in the museum, I was like, you, I gotta talk to you. I love your piece. And I told him the story about how I reframed it and everything. He was like, oh, that's so great that you like it, you know? And um, so anytime he's around, I would always say hi. And then eventually the Birchfield, they were like, you guys all wanna, you wanna go on a trip after work? You wanna go out to the studio in Lockport? And we're like, yeah, let's carpool out to Lockport. And uh, so we all get in this car together and um, we, we go down and we go into his house, into his, um, I got just one little picture of part of his studio, but you go down in and it was like two rooms stretched out and there was just things everywhere, like up the walls, in boxes, all types of paper, because he would just draw on anything he could get his hands on. And um, he was just so nice and so sweet. And um, while I'm there at the studio, he, he takes me aside and he's like, oh, so, so you're an artist. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm working on the show, but I don't know if it's like really strong work. I feel like I kind of like should abandon these pieces. And he was like, he gave me some advice that I really kept and actually do follow a lot to this day. So it was like really significant for me that he would take me aside and talk to me. And he says, um, you're just going to make so much stuff. As an artist, you're just going to make so much stuff. And most of it is not going to be that great. It's, it's just going to be garbage. And if you want to, you can like throw it away. Nobody has to see it. Or, you know, if you start a piece and it's not good, and you know it's not good from the start, don't finish it. You know, let it go, start again. And um, he said, but you know what matters is that other 25%, what you're making that's good and meaningful. And um, so hold on to that stuff and don't worry about the stuff that's bad. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I never really thought of it that way because 
you're sometimes when you're young your focus is like I got to get every piece right if I don't it's really embarrassing but like obviously he didn't care um, <laughs> he I think that he was really just kind of like as a teacher comforting a young artist because he kept so much stuff and he when somebody asked him when he was retired you know oh, are you, are you still painting? And he was like, of course I'm still painting. I can't stop it. It's like artistic diarrhea. <laughs> and, and for him, like, to have made like 5,000 to 7,000 paintings in his lifetime, I just can't imagine that volume. And so obviously he was just like, oh, no, it's okay. You know? <laughs> I was like, I'll take it. And I'll take it to heart and I'll love it. And he, then he was like, you know, I'll sell you, you know, a piece that you want. And he sold me... This little remote goes, this little guy. And he was like, I'll give that to you for like 30 bucks. And I love it. This is one of my favorite things in my house. And it's just a little colored pencil drawing. And the way he was with people, I just love it. <laughs> I don't have a lot more to say about it, but I enjoy it every day. Well, you know, and because he's known for, you know, he's known for his lifelong career in art and art education but mostly also for like his sense of humor and his storytelling ability. Like everybody who I talked to was like, oh, he's the best storyteller. He was so funny. And um, the thing about that too is like between all that humor and stuff, he had such particular views on art and who art is for and why art is made. And I'm gonna put up um, a picture actually that Jerry Mead gave me the other day that he owns. And don't try to read it because it's hard to read, but I'll read it to you. <laughs> That kind of explains that a little bit. So I say, art is the real specialty of life. It doesn't exist for the ordinary. It is the spare time of the rich. It is the playpen of the important people. It is the chance for history for those who have contributed. It is the accent for history. It gives immortality to silly times and to serious times. Above all, art is not for the artists. He specifically believed that art was for the viewer that you're creating something, but it's something that has to be engaged with to exist, or otherwise it's worthless. Um, this was pretty exemplified by um, how important he thought titling works was. Um, they were funny, or very simple, or a really just a light description, because he thought titles were like a kicking off point of, of a viewer's understanding of the piece, and that if you didn't title it, you were being really pretentious. <laughs> actually, in um, the audio for The Living Legacy, he actually discusses this, and this is a quote when he says, I'm not just trying to be funny. Contemporary art, which I'm not against, will do a painting and it will say, no title, untitled. Well, that's just a terrible thing. What are people supposed to look at and associate, project, if there's nothing there to lead them? Now, my work has realism, so it was easier. They can follow it. But if it was a total abstract subject and I had no title on it, it's an abstract subject. I disagree with those painters that do that. I don't think anyone should ever do that because the whole purpose of painting is what? Sharing. If it isn't sharing, then what's the sense in it? You can sit on the third floor of a house and say I'm the greatest painter in the world and never show anybody anything. You could do that, I guess, but it's not true. Even Cezanne felt the same way. Unless you could share something with someone, it had no point. And he kind of goes to that metaphor a lot when he's speaking about art. He says, like, you could sit up in a window and look out a window and never show anybody anything. And I find it funny that, like, that's his, you know, smuggest painter he could imagine, is this guy who sits up in a house and is just like, I'm the best, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but never lets anybody see it, which is really cute. So I have some examples um, of the way that he titled work. Like, this... <laughs> It says everything and starts you into the narrative of the piece without you ever having to have somebody explain it to you. It's just beautiful and simple and bright. <laughs> and this one's a nice simple descriptor. This is also Jerry's piece. I love this one. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of his sense of humor came from his father, which I, which I found out was he was a uh, pro minor league baseball player and kind of a little local celebrity. And by the time Joe came around, he was a postman. 
but he was known for the exact same traits, for his humor and his uh, storytelling ability and that everybody just wanted to be around him and he was demand, in demand for social situations and people would be like, oh, uh, is he going to be at that wake? <laughs> and they would go there and uh, he passed that on to his four children and from what I hear, when they all got together, it was a hilarious time. I would have loved to have seen some documentation of that. But it was lucky that he had that and that his father taught him that because when he was seven or eight, um, he was diagnosed with his bone disease and not expected to live. And uh, his father took him over to be blessed by Father Baker, who said, this kid's going to live, you know. You can, you can count on that. And told him he would pull through. And he did after he spent almost three years in a hospital where he actually learned to draw because he was, you know, did three years in a hospital. So <laughs> he learned that he loved drawing more than anything else. And uh, they had craft classes at the hospital and it was his first time he had ever touched um, pastels and charcoals and he really loved them. And when he was released, but not, you know, it's not cured, it was something he had his whole life, he had a really bad leg but never let that limit him. He was determined to do just about anything. And uh, I love the self-portrait about that. Um, he always did his painting standing. That was part of his process. And uh, when he was in a sophomore in college, he had his knee fused, so he really couldn't do much beyond that. But from what I've heard, uh, it didn't stop him as a child. He decided he was going to ride a bike, and he still got on a bike and rode the bike. And he was still riding it after his knee was fused in college. Um, I particularly like this self-portrait because it also includes the chair. Like, you could sit in the chair, but he's not going to sit in the chair because he didn't consider himself disabled. He never did. And that was a big point with him. But um, when he got out, he decided to, you know, he, I got to keep going with this art. I really love it. So he learned from a Belgian nun at a convent called Sister Mary Julia, who he was just enamored with. In uh, his interviews, he says, oh, I could, hear, I could listen to her say Kante Cran all day, <laughs> <laughs> which was really sweet because he didn't know that. Like years and years later, when they did an exhibition um, of our educators who are important, they would be shown in the same space as peers, like this person who he had learned from as a child and um, that was significant for him. And he continued pursuing arts through high school. All his teachers were very encouraging. He had a really good set of educators and decided, you know, I'm going to go to college for art. But his family didn't have a lot of money. So as a testament to his determination, because he hated being labeled as disabled, he applied for a scholarship, a disability scholarship from the state, and got a full scholarship to RIT. But he was there, he was so happy, he was learning everything, he loved his teachers, and he loved it so much he felt he didn't deserve it. So, and you know, one of his quotes is, you know, many people in the art world are conflicted with chaos, and that chaos is personal. And I think for him, it was feeling like he had survived something so big, and he owed somebody something. So he had a crisis of faith, and decided to go to seminary school. <laughs> and he was there for three years. And he painted the whole time that he was there. But he did uh, end up leaving, thankfully, for everybody else. And still held on to what he had, he had learned there. And religion was always very important for him and remained a theme that he would go back to very often. He liked to recreate religious iconography and art within his like scenes of everyday life. He would sneak it into some of the bar scenes and the pool halls. and. He actually loved the idea of Christ as just a human being, living his life, like outside of the biblical fancy things that you are always hearing about. And um, he talks about this painting I wish I could find a picture of, but I cannot. Um, it's a painting of Jesus and Lazarus, Lazarus having breakfast, just hanging out having breakfast. <laughs> and he was so upset that like they had such a significant friendship. And the only thing that was represented was, in the Bible was um, the miracle and the death and he thought like obviously they just hung out they were just guys they must be living their life so when he was out of seminary school he went back to school for his art, for his art education and he was like this is my backup plan <laughs> in case being an illustrator doesn't work out 
but like every almost every artist you know here in Buffalo or anywhere in Western New York, you end up doing your backup plan and doing your art on the side. And so he was an art educator for 35 years in multiple locations across Western New York, but most of it in Lockport. While well, he raised his family of eight children and he did um, side jobs. He did some very interesting side jobs actually for the summers. Um, he taught private painting lessons. He spent four summers doing medical illustration at Roswell Park, which he loved, which I think definitely tied into his love of the human figure because there were so many interesting parts in there. But then he did a couple summers at Cornell Lab in the technical illustration and he hated it. He was like, it was all lines and it was so boring. <laughs> And I get that that would be pretty bad. <laughs> but a lot of his work had, um, he worked in a lot of similar themes as he went through. And um, one of them was definitely his landscapes. Um, he worked on landscapes, I think, all the way from RIT through to the end. And uh, he did so many of Lockport and the surrounding area, but he also did um, trips around and to New England and did paintings and I know he was he did a lot of paintings of the canals for people to sell and he was pretty like how many times can you paint the same canal you know but you do what you got to do to uh, pay the bills and um, his landscapes are very expressive and and just beautiful like this one I actually found on an auction site and uh, I was like oh I'm jealous of whoever bought that because it's such a, a mundane scene it's some branches that fell in the snow and it's just stunning and the colors he chose you wouldn't even see. I know he was um, aware of and contemporary with Birchfield and so I feel like his idea of visual language was a little more color and uh, I think it shows in a lot of pieces. Um, I love this one. <laughs> but he did a lot of uh, the water and uh, I know he did a ton of yes. So he also did a bunch of illustrations, um, some historical of the canal workers, as part of what he was working on for Lockport. And I have these um, beautiful <laughs> this guy, which is more of a colorful one. But I also have these beautiful drawings that are that show like his illustration process, where he would start with like the sketch for the details and then take it out and flesh it out and like convey the story that he wanted to convey. Like now she's smoking a pipe for some reason, <laughs> <laughs> and like he's dirtier, and I love it because it um, just to hash out the basic elements and then bring it to a full story within the simple line work like that. These guys too. This guy got a lot happier. But uh, <laughs> he also ended up doing a lot of home commissions, like, like you do. Um, <laughs> he thinks he did maybe around 400 of them. And while I was learning about that, I learned this like really great story where he had said, uh, you know, he did this, he was at this woman's house, and she, she says, oh, could you paint my house? And he goes, oh, yeah, I can do that. He goes out, does a sketch, takes it home, does a painting, and then he brings it back, and she's like, oh, this is great, except you forgot the lilac bushes. And he was incensed. And he said, you know what? If you want it, uh, if you want it like that, you can get an art student to come do this for you. You don't have to buy this painting. <laughs> I'll just take it back. <laughs> because he felt that if you're just taking a photograph of something, you're taking a photograph of something, but that wasn't art to reproduce a photograph. He, in fact, talks about um, an artist that painted over photographs and how he thought that that was an art, that that was cheating, and that was, you know, you were scamming the people you were selling the art to. So, of course, he's like, artistic interpretation is more important than the lilac, your stinking lilac bushes, you know? <laughs> so I couldn't find um, a lot of images. It's very hard to actually find his work online which we'll talk about um, a little bit more towards the end, a project that they're working on to rectify that. But one of the other, oh, yeah. And he did, uh, he did things like this where um, he would do a, like a house commission or um, an important commission and then sell like that. And I just love this old ad. And you know, Penny kept it so it's all wiggled with his Sharpie. 
But the pool hall was also another um, big theme that he worked with. Uh, he had worked in one in college, and I think that that kind of led more into his um, bar room scenes, which are pretty important. And these also um, have a lot of, this one's a solo man, but there's a lot of interaction in a lot of them. They they've a lot of characters, and that's more fleshed out in um, in the <laughs> okay in the characters. He knew these people. A lot of them. They were people that were real people, or they were people that he knew, and he took elements of them to create a fictional person. And this story I thought was really funny that I found out. So there was a woman who in Lockport would pick flowers, and she was like a rounder woman. And she would uh, bend over, you know, pick the flowers, and he drew this painting, it did a painting of her from behind. And he was absolutely convinced that somebody had stole that painting to make those wooden lady bending over things in people's <laughs> gardens, but he didn't know how. <laughs> so I thought that that was really funny. That <laughs> but she was, a, she was a real woman. Um, <laughs> but the barroom scenes are particularly important for him. He felt that they were his most important and intense work. And um, he thought of them as like miniature American operas, where he was telling the story of the people who were there and what they were doing. And at that time, he was struggling with his own alcoholism. So he was a part of that. And he, had, he knew those regulars very deeply. And he knew what it was like to be there and be a part of it. Um, he did end up, you know, becoming sober, and he decided, you know, I'm not going to go back in there ever again, but I'm going to do these scenes from memory. So all the paintings after he became sober were from memory and not from uh, life drawings. And every character that he drew in these scenes had a nickname, whether it was a real person's nickname or some bizarre thing he came up with when he was making them up. They all had a nickname, and he, in some of his interviews, just, he rambles some of them, and they're so weird, but uh, you gotta wonder, like, is that someone's real nickname? And I bet you it is at that point. But they are very, very interesting captures of, like, strange moments that you don't really think about. Like, you're all in a bar, and you're waiting for something, and you're just leaning there, but it's this slice of life that almost is like a photographer took their camera out and it, that it came from him instead of like a, a photograph is, is fascinating that this was all cataloged inside of him. He had an amazing impact on the Western New York art world. Um, he was one of the founding six members of the Niagara Watercolor Society which they formed when there was a juried exhibition and the paintings, the watercolor paintings were being lumped in with the sketches and the drawings because they were like, that's not a painting, that's a, that's a drawing. And so him and the five other artists got together and they were like, no, we're gonna make our own society and we're gonna make sure that they're counted as paintings because watercolors are paintings. <laughs> and he did and that's a very successful um, society and it's still going and now they have over 250 members uh, he was an active and showing member of the Buffalo Society of Artists for over 50 years, which is a lot of years <laughs> to do that. And he spent 35 years as an art educator, and he taught so many artists. He's one of those people where you talk to people, and they're like, yeah, I taught him, or, my, or uh, I learned from him, or my cousin learned from him, or this guy I lived down the street lived from him. And it's, it's kind of wonderful to hear how many people that he touched their lives and he's just, they love him, they all love him. I posted about the talk on Facebook and everyone's like, oh, I love him, he was my family, I knew him when I was a kid, and he did this and this, and it was, it was wonderful. Um, he did a lot of uh, philanthropic work. Whenever there was art auctions almost, I always saw he had some little piece in there, he, did, uh, he donated to a lot of things, and at the end of his life, the last thing he did, um, Oh, also he acted, <laughs> which I thought was really cute. This was in the Birchfield archives. So um, that's him in the 70s in, uh, I think it's A Tale of All Seasons. Yeah. Man. Man for All Seasons. Yeah, it's wonderful. 
But the last thing he did um, was he created this uh, this poster for domestic violence to benefit the uh, YWCA. And uh, this is about when he wasn't really able to paint much anymore. And um, it was just this little itty bitty drawing. And it was just such a powerful image that they were like, let's, let's go with this one. This is such a, this is it. And uh, so I know Jay told me he had to blow it up to make sure it didn't look bad. And then he had to get, it was drawn on a, a scrap of notebook paper. So he had to get the texture of the paper out from behind to get it. But this ended up on billboards and he did the signed limited edition prints. And I thought that was really wonderful as I've also dealt with that situation myself. So, so part of um, the problem I had when I was doing research was the imagery. It's hard to get your hands on unless you've got the resources like I do where I'm like, can I just come in here and look through your archives? Or I made an appointment with Jay and he let me take pictures of cards that I bought and things like that. <laughs> and um, so I thought this was wonderful that the Niagara Art Trail is working on a whale and legacy project. They are trying to collect any pieces anybody has take photographs of them and um, archive them and keyword them so you can search through and find different pieces. And I mean, that's a, such an undertaking with five to 7,000 paintings. I don't, I don't understand how he's gonna be able to get through it, but um, there's a, a little description of it that is, uh, over a period of 75 years, Joe produced thousands of works, both formally and informally. In addition to the paintings we know, there are sketches, sometimes done quickly on a napkin or a scrap of paper, birthday cards, humorous cartoons, posters, and so much more. There are menus, programs from plays, reunions and the like, logos, et cetera, et cetera. All these are important for the catalog. And I have a little, actually a um, sample of that from the archives that he sent to Charlie Penny. It's just on the outside of the envelope, this beautiful little winter scene. And these could, you know, they're in somebody's file boxes at home. They got a Christmas card. He did Christmas cards. Sometimes he would alter a larger painting. I heard that he would alter sometimes pretty bleak city scenes and throw like a Christmas wreath on there. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, this is the Christmas card this year. <laughs> but um, there was also a, a little barroom scene in there that I was a little, I'm not gonna show, but I'm gonna talk about because it was a little salty, but it was a joke for Mr. Bannon that uh, these two men in a bar and the one guy goes, oh, you know, I would, I would give like a million Clifford Stills for just one Charlie Penny, or um, one Birchfield. And the guy's like, oh, me too. <laughs> and so he's like throwing a little shade from the Albright or the Birchfield, <laughs> which I thought was super cute. And that was his welcome back to the Birchfield card for Bannon. <laughs> but, um, the Legacy Projects also at Niagara Trail, they produce um, reproductions, they make cards, they make calendars, they sell the originals from the estate and all the proceeds go back towards the family, which I think is amazing. Um, so if you have one and it's not documented, whaleandlegacy.com please, and contact them. So I'm gonna wrap it up with a, you know, a little bit of a uh, quote from Joe with his advice for young artists and this great sketch that he did said whatever they do in art they must be honest because it will drag you down and I'm not talking about stealing I'm not talking about cash register honest I'm talking about the other type of honesty that only you live with that's so important to have now you may do paintings that may not exactly be what you wanted but that's okay and it's just another step forward look at it that way and that's part of your honesty and you should be honest. You shouldn't try to get anywhere in this business through something else. I've seen that, but it shouldn't happen. That's the first thing I'll tell them. And then the second is that you've got to have a lot of courage. So anybody has any stories or questions or? That was great. <laughs> to tell a story. I would love to hear more about them. Oh, you got time. Awesome. <laughs>
begins. I, I would say that in the 62 years we were married, he painted every day except the last two years. Wow. He was so sick that he couldn't. So that's why there were so many, you know, paintings and so forth. And you knew that he was in the AA, but did you know that he was in for 40 something years? Yeah. So he really was sober longer than he was. Let's not, say sober. not sober. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I had heard that he had also, um, he would give people in AA drawings of themselves and little drawings he made yeah. while he was there. And one of the things that gave him the greatest pleasure was getting, helping people become sober. So oh. one of his vocations became not just painting, but helping people with a sobriety. It was a very big thing to him. That's it wonderful. Meant a lot to him. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and then the other thing toward the end that he did even more than at the beginning was I would say every young painter in Lockport came to our house for help. Mm -hmm. He just let them come and ask for they help? They came even when he couldn't get out of his chair. Oh. Some came every week, brought stuff, he critiqued, he told them what he thought <laughs> would help. So right toward the end, he was a, you know, he was a helper to those young paintings and young painters. And, and I know paint. that standing to paint was part of his process, so then when his other leg gave, is that specifically why you think he couldn't really paint, was because he couldn't? I don't know, he always stood, that I knew. He always stood up, he, uh, he had a drafting table that he used, and he had it, he did not use, he, he really did most of his stuff on the drafting table. After he started doing, after he stopped doing oils, and then he went to tempera, then he went to watercolor and he did smaller stuff. So he can do a lot of big stuff and I think that's the reason. Because he could do it on the drafting table and that's what he painted on mostly. Wonderful. You know, toward the beginning of his career he did mostly oils and then of course they got to be too much trouble because it took too long to dry as you know. And then he, yeah. he went to Tempera's and, and he was using that. But watercolor was the thing that he liked the best and he worked with that the most. I've heard, you know, um, the person who I, I talked to at the bird show was Bill Mention. Obviously, you've met right, him, right. and he he just loved Joe so much, and he said, you know, there's a lot of watercolor artists in Western New York, and I think that he is one of the most significant and does not get as much attention as he should because he is so skilled, and the fact that he could do so many different things, so many different styles, so many different mediums. And the quality was I always the same. Shows and, I, and I've stood there and seen things I never saw because he so much. <laughs> I mean, never see the, these paintings. Actually, some of them, I never saw Lucy's red painting. Oh, yeah? I, mean, I don't think so. Oh. But in any case, I, I think I would see them and I would sometimes think four different artists painted them because of the different styles that I would see in four separate paintings, which I think is interesting. This last show that he had, I saw that. You know, there was some stuff that people had that I hadn't seen. And oh, yeah. Just, well, there were people that would come in the house, and he'd be painting, and they would say, when you finish with that, I want it. <laughs> so it would go out of the house before I ever even saw it get finished. Well, I'll, um, I'll tell you something funny I learned. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a miniature gray area. Yeah. But, um, so, Don works at the Birchfield. was like, I really want a painting of his, and this was some years ago. Uh -huh. And, and, um... Bill went and got some things from Joe for something else, and uh, Don was like, I don't know about those. I really love the one that you're going to donate to the gala. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so Joe's like, yeah, I'll sell you that one. Just switch out the piece. <laughs> and so I know he has that one, and he just loves it. But yeah. he was so easygoing. Yes, like, did you switch to the Scarlet Pimpernel one again? Yeah. yeah. take a picture. Thank oh. you. Go all the way back. <laughs> did you ever see that? I, I don't think no. that. Oh, I just, I just love it. The expression of the women, the, the expertise in the clothing, like to be able to demonstrate that the boots he's wearing are so shiny in like just one tone of color. It's such a beautiful piece, and that little hint of the bridge up top. Yeah, I never saw it. I know I never saw it. Well, you know, I think he gave it to my dad. That's what I was just going to ask you. Was yes. it from your parents? Yes, <laughs> because um, I think he gave it to my dad. He liked to get the literary reference. Yeah. Something that he thought he would like. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, maybe they were reading about it. Yeah. 
the yeah. the Scarlet Pimpernel so is that about a spy? Well, the book. Yes. You know, I want to say De Maupassant, but no. Alan? No. No, no. Where is Orson? Yeah, but Liz's dad was one of those that would come into the house and say, "I'd like that." <laughs> And they, and they work together. Well, I also heard he was incredibly generous yeah, right. yeah. with his family. Yeah, exactly. with, like, yeah. Which, I mean, when you're an artist. So I probably did never see it. <laughs> and yet, and uh, would you guys have 25 grandkids? Yeah, yeah. Or do you have yeah, more? 24 grandchildren, 20. and then we have, we have uh, seven great grandchildren. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it happens when you have eight kids. <laughs> <laughs> And I know you were a teacher. I was a teacher. And um, Jade told me that your family had 125 teachers in the family tree. Yeah, most of them on Joe's side, really. Oh, really? Yeah, most of them on Joe's. Joe's mother was a teacher in dance and history. Yeah, and, and all my children, not all my children, but several of my children. And yeah. One of the, he, one of the funny stories I heard from him in the, in, in the interviews was that um, he would, uh, you know, as part of his teaching, he would use this book that had nudes in it, because you know it's our history. There's going to be nudes, and he would go through each page at the beginning and be like, "This is a nude. If you're uncomfortable with it, turn it over. But if you alter this book, <laughs> like, I will mess you." <laughs> like he didn't say that, but you know he was like, "It does not need anything. Do not alter it." And he said nobody ever altered it, <laughs> which I thought was funny because um, where I grew up, there was not a lot of money in the school system. So my art teachers were like, uh, here's a, some stuff you can hot glue together. So to hear these stories of these wonderful teachers that took the time and people just love them and you got that kickstart on art. But Joe was not easy. Yeah. He was a tough teacher. He, he sounds like it. Very tough. I mean, people would say, he took me and he laid me up against the wall. <laughs> and then they'd say, and they're the ones that came to our house to see them after they got out of the high school or wherever they were, you know. I, he was a very tough teacher, and even though he was funny, he didn't take anything from anybody. Yeah. No, he didn't take, I mean, I'm talking about the kids, you know, so he was strict. And so, in fact, he retired, he said, if I don't retire, I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's what he said about the books. He's like, I'd probably get in trouble if I taught this now. <laughs> oh, my God. I loved, I, I didn't get a lot of interaction with them, but I loved the ones that I had. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for letting me do this. Oh, you did a really good job. Thank you. <laughs>